Good morning. We welcome you to our 9 o'clock worship. Thank you for being here to praise God this hour with the family here at Washington Street. Uh, I encourage you, if you have not done so, to fill out an attendance card. Uh, there will be uh, some in, right in front of you. Fill one of those out. Pass it to either aisle, and we'll have some gentlemen come through in just a moment and uh, pick those up. Thankful for the rain that uh, God has sent and uh, for what it does to restore the, His creation. Um, so thankful. We're, in fact, we're starting off with This is My Father's World. So uh, it's always appropriate to acknowledge His role as the Creator and Lord of all the earth. Lots of news and announcements in the bulletin. If you didn't get one of those, be sure to snag one before you leave there's lots of activities you'll want to be involved in today and throughout the week. If you'd like to look stand as we begin our work. This is my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and proudly brings the music of the spheres. This is my For this opportunity to be here today for the opportunity to worship Lord give us hearts ready to worship you father in the midst of that we pray that we come before you with the right attitude acknowledging you as who you are acknowledging you for what you've done for us and acknowledging you as the one and true and only God as we focus our hearts for worship father we pray that we Lay aside worldly things that distract us. And Father, right now there are so many, and we pray for your grace and mercy as we think on those as we're laying them aside. <laughs> Father, in our midst are unexplained viral diseases, cancers, difficulties of the spirit and mind, loss, and a lot of other distractions. Father, we pray that as we gather to worship, we lay them at, the, at your altar and focus upon you, although we pray for your grace and mercy and healing in each of those situations. Father, give us a heart for worship, a 
heart to listen to the message of the hour, a heart to take it into our hearts and to produce fruit this week, Father. Give us feet and hands to be Christ to others because we have been here this week. Father, give us a heart to know that you're in our midst, to behave as you're in our midst, Father, and to be glad and thankful that we can commune with you today. Give us worship in spirit and truth, Father, inside of your will as we go forward this day and this hour. Give us a spirit of thankfulness for having been here and for those that we've seen, those that are new, those that are good friends, and those we may haven't seen for a long time. But Father, even as we celebrate those things and the opportunities they bring, give us a heart for worshiping you. Give us a heart focused like our Savior's heart was focused on doing your will as we worship you this day. Forgive us, Father, for those things that we don't know that we're doing against you, Father, but more importantly, for those that we are, that we do know. Give us a heart of repentance, Father, and a spirit of a desire to serve you each and every day. Father, grant us a heart truly ready for worship. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. This is holy ground, we're standing on holy ground, for the Lord is present, and where He is, is holy, this is holy ground. Ephesians 
1, starting in verse 11 and read down through verse 14. So if you want to turn there to kind of help us focus our minds on the opportunity here to partake of the Lord's Supper. So if you want to, you can follow along with me there. Ephesians 1, 11, 11 through 14. It says, In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you, when you also believed, were sealed in him with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance, until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. So as we gather around this table to, to remember, of course, the sacrifice that Jesus made, but the opportunity that we have to live with him one day uh, in heaven together, and I just uh, pray that we do that. Let's partake of his uh, communion here in the worthy man. You will pray with him. Dear God, I just want to come to you. Thank you for this beautiful morning, God. You are a creator of all things. Uh, just thank you for the beauty that you bring out in our, our world, and we see your creation, God, each and every day. We know you're involved in our lives, God. And just thank you for this time as we gather at, together as a family, God, around your table, and just to, to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, that we could live with you one day, God. And just uh, pray as we take of this, the, uh, the bread, that we remember his body, God, there on that cross, God. He didn't stay there. He rose. God, and I thank you for that example. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would bow with me again. 
Dear God, as we continue this feast here around your table, I just pray, God, that uh, we take this, uh, the fruit of the vine, God, that represents Christ's blood. I just pray we take it in a worthy manner that we never forget the, the love that was shown there on that cross, God, the, uh, that you gave us, God, the ability to be able to live with you one day, God. Cross name we pray. Amen. <laughs> That's love.
the same as the same. <clears throat> they tried my Lord and Master. Christmas commercials, all that stuff. Anyone else there, guys? We're going to start a support group after church. <laughs> We're going to need a little help to get through the next couple of months, but it's good to be here this morning. Let's talk about Jesus. He's the reason we're here, amen? We're not here for any other reason. We're here for Him. He is our Lord and Savior. And let's talk a little bit about the Lord of the harvest for just a few moments this morning. Uh, I want to direct your attention to a passage found in John chapter 4, verse 35. We made mention a little bit last week when we talked about Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20, and, and we talked about the loss of the harvest. And, and I even mentioned this last week, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, and I want to do it again this morning. I want to talk about this, this thought uh, that Jesus gives about himself. In this one passage in John chapter 4, verse 35. Now, our text this morning will come from Matthew, and, and we'll, get it, we'll get there in just a few moments in chapter 9. We'll look at verses 35 through 30, 38. But this passage in John 4, again, if I were to ask you, what do you think about Jesus? Who is he? You know, the Hebrew writer, and I've mentioned this in a, a, a class, of, I don't know, a month ago. Hebrew writer says that without faith it's impossible to please him, right in verse 6, chapter 11. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Let's just stop right there. Who is it that we believe, or what is it or, that we believe about God? Who is he? Maybe a more appropriate question. Who is he? We must believe that he is. Well, who is he? And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, when you think about Jesus and when you think about who, who was God in the flesh and you think about God, who is he? And what kind of impact about knowing him does he have on your life? And one of the things, one of the characteristics, one of the names that Jesus gives himself, so we don't have to guess who he is, right? He tells us right here in this passage in John 4 verse 35 who he is. You might remember in this discussion with the woman at the well, and we will eventually uh, in the coming weeks get to this passage, this section in John 4. But verse 35, do you not say four more months and then the harvest? Uh, again, it's just my uh, uh, understanding. It's my understanding of this text that, that the harvest was not ready yet, right? Because this is a question. Do you not say four more months until the harvest? So they still had four more months until that harvest time would come, right? From the time that they had sown the seed until harvest would come. And, and I see Jesus saying, look, look, you're anticipating a harvest day. 
four months from now. You're looking ahead. I, I want to tell you, don't, don't wait four months about the harvest I'm talking about. Jesus was talking about people, right? Harvesting people. Don't wait. Don't look ahead and think you've got time. That harvest is right now. And that's what he says here. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. But again, I, he's not talking about the literal, har the literal wheat, winter wheat fields. It's not what he's referring to, right? Because they still had four months before they got white and ready for harvest. He said, I tell you, look at the fields. And what was he wanting them to do? He was wanting them to look at people. He said, I want you to look at the fields. For they are already white for harvest. Do you remember last week I asked you, I said, how many of you people watched? And a lot of us raised our hands. Did you do that this week? And when you saw them, did you see them as people who needed Jesus? Was that the main thought that came to mind over this last week? And if you really didn't do that, I want to ask you to do that again this week. When you're out people watching and you're noticing, I want you to think about people and I want you to think about the, the number of people that are lost without Jesus. We have to have a heart that is filled with compassion for people who are lost without Jesus. Amen? You know, in Matthew chapter 9, let's go ahead and go to that text. That, is the, that will serve as the text uh, for us today. But what did... Uh, what do we learn about Jesus? Well, we learn that he's interested in the harvest. He's a harvester, isn't he? Jesus is a harvester. And as a matter of fact, in our next passage, we're even going to see the title that he's the Lord of the harvest. He's interested in the harvest. And let's make no mistake about it. That's the reason for which he came. He, he is the reason. That reason is the, is the reason we're here this morning. Amen. We're, we're here because of Jesus. And we're here because Jesus was interested in the harvest. Now think about it. We're, we're a couple of thousand years removed from the days that Jesus spoke these words. But yet, his impact over 2,000 years has touched us right here in Fayetteville, Tennessee. And in this passage in Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 35, we see how Jesus cared and was concerned about the harvest, right? Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. That's a lot of what Brother J.B. just prayed about up here a few moments ago. <coughs> That's how Jesus saw these people. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Now, totally different situation than John 4, but the harvest was still the same. The context may have changed, but the fact that people need Jesus, the fact that people need to be saved, has not changed. And right here in Matthew chapter 9, we see that Jesus sees them as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. If you want to underline any passage in this text, if you'd like to underline in your Bible, if you want to write something down, I want you to realize what Jesus says here. The harvest is plentiful. Nothing's changed over the last 2,000 years for that. But notice what he says, there, uh, but the workers are few. Verse 38, ask the Lord of the harvest. There's our title. Therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. I, I want to brag on this church. There are a lot of good things going on in this church. Amen? This is an active, moving, growing church. And what a blessing it is to be a part of such a wonderful church family. You know, I, I was thinking about a group that often gets overlooked here but they're almost involved in everything we do here, our food group. I was just thinking just, just over the last week or two, how many opportunities they've had to serve this church and to, to serve people and to help people to, to have something to eat when they come in our midst. And what a, what a blessing. Just even this past Wednesday night, thinking about all the good that we're doing. Do you realize that we had over 350 people here for our trunk or treat? 350 people. Now, some of them were you, and a lot of folks from our community came. How awesome was that? 
Now, if you're asking for a preacher's count, it was 900 to 1,000. But, but anyway, somewhere around in there, you know, we had a lot of people here, right? And so I was thinking about the fact that we had 50 families to register that were not a part of our spiritual family here. That's, that's, that's pretty good. What are we going to do with those families? We're just going to say, oh, we're thankful they came once, or we're going to try to reach out and try to help and try to embrace and try to encourage that's what God, God calls us to do. There are a lot of great things happening right here. And, and there's a lot to be commended. But I will tell you that if we are not doing everything that we can to help win souls for Jesus, then all of that good really is for nothing. If, we're, if we are here to just entertain ourselves, to feel good about ourselves, to pat ourselves on the back, and not involved in, be involved in the harvest and go out into the fields to, to pick the harvest, if we fail to do that. You know, l last week I mentioned one statement that a farmer who fails to bring in the harvest is a failure. And I, I hate to say that, but that is true for any church. The very reason for Jesus came, our Lord came to seek and to save the lost. If we are followers, disciples of our Lord, shouldn't that be our mission, our heart, it shouldn't that be the reason that we have compassion for the people in our community? It should be. Again, I want to commend this church for the good that's, that's going on. And I don't want to diminish that in any way. But I want to tell you, we've got to be busy with seeking and saving the lost right here at Washington Street. That's what God has called us to do. Do you realize that the harvest is the very reason for which he came? I mean, think about it. He didn't come uh, to be praised, although he deserves it. Amen. Jesus deserves to be praised, but that's not why he came. He, he didn't come to obtain or to get. He wasn't a power hungry individual, although in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to him and he has all authority. Make no mistake about it. But he didn't come for that purpose. He, he didn't come for prominence just to be recognized. He didn't walk into the temple. As I mentioned last week, you know, the first time Jesus ever uh, acknowledged who he was was to a sinful woman by a well. He didn't waltz into the temple and say, do you people know who I am? I am God in the flesh. No, it wasn't for prominence. But it was for each and every person that has ever walked the face of this earth. That's why he came. You and I are the reason the very reason that Jesus Christ came. I want you to think about that. Regardless of how bad you think you are, Jesus came for you anyway. You're not so low or so sinful that he can't save you. He's the reason. We are the reason he came. Jesus came to save this world from sin. And praise God for that. I mean, Mark, I know you. Praise God for that. Amen. Uh, thank you, Laura, for acknowledging that. But all of us, all of us, right? All joking aside, Mark, all of us. There is none righteous, no, not one. Have you read Romans 3? And that's actually a quote from the Old Testament. What did Jesus, uh, what did Paul say in Romans 3, 23? Yes, we're all guilty. Every one of us. No one's exempt. We're all sinners. Praise God that Jesus came. But when he came, what moved him? What, was, what did he do while he was here? You know, aren't you grateful that you have... How many of you have a Bible? Hold it up. I've got mine in electronic form here. Got all my verses. Hold that up. Aren't you grateful that you have within your hands the, the very thing that God lifted up the curtain and let you see a little bit about His Son? You know, we could be guessing and we could be dreaming and we could be thinking about... You know, what was Jesus like and, and who, what, who is he? And we could be questioning all of that. But you realize God, God lifted up the curtain. He let us peek in and catch a glimpse of his son Jesus. And, and what did we get to see? What did Matthew and others get to see? Matthew shares a little bit about what we got to see and how Jesus lived while he was here. And I'm thankful for that. So let's think about this for just a few moments. Let's think about the, the reason, the passion behind why Jesus did what he did. And let's think about how he lived among us. Number one, he served people. Can I ask you an honest question? Are you a servant? 
Mark, don't we, don't we sing that song, Make Me a Servant? Make me, uh, is that, uh, is that a, a, not just a song we sing, not just a cool song, but is that really a theme? Is that a passion for life? It was for Jesus. I want you to think about it again. Again in uh, verse 35, Matthew says that Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching, preaching, and healing. Okay, now I, I'm not here to make a case about the miraculous uh, ministry of Jesus. It, it, it served a purpose. It was for the, uh, the purpose of presenting that he was God in the flesh. He was doing God-like things. It certainly pointed to his deity. Even the miracles that came afterwards with the disciples when Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit and, and these, uh, these apostles would be able to do miraculous things. Think again. It was for the same purpose to point back to Jesus as being the eternal Son of God. As a matter of fact, that's how John, in John chapter uh, 20, uh, verse 31, and, and, and also chapter, third, uh, chapter 21, verse Third, uh, verse 25, that's how he ends it, right? That these things were written so that we may believe. It was to point back to the deity of Christ. But if you look at the other two in this section, the preaching and the teaching, that's supposed to continue even today, right? We're here not to entertain ourselves, but to talk about Jesus, to talk about his matchless grace. We're here to think about how awesome he is. And just think about it. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful for Jesus Christ? For the fact that he was willing to teach and to preach and to share God's wonderful word with others? He's the savior of the world, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, in Acts chapter 2, that's, kind of, that's one of the first things that Peter says. Uh, aside from how he starts to present in verse 22 of Acts 2, uh, uh, how he starts to present Jesus as being the one true and living Messiah. But you get to about verse... Verses, uh, verse 36 and following, God made this Jesus whom you crucified, get this, both Lord and Christ, or Savior. Everyone loves him as Lord, I mean as Savior, right? To accept him as Lord is a totally different concept, right? That means I have to listen to what he says, I have to follow and do it, I have to follow him wherever he tells me to go and do whatever he tells me to do. But I want you to also understand that it, not only do we understand him as Lord, we understand him not only a savior of the world, but also a servant of the world. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to what? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. Let's not jump ahead to the fact that he's only a savior. No, he's also a servant, a suffering servant as well. The Jewish historian Josephus, he tells us that, that at the time that Jesus was ministering in Galilee, he says there were over 200 cities in Galilee. That sounds like a lot in one small area, about 40 miles wide, 70 miles long. Around 200 cities in Galilee. And I don't want you to miss this. He, he goes on to say that even from conservative estimates, so most of those cities contained at least 15,000 people. If you start to do the math, you will come up with around 3 million people in Galilee. Now, now looking back at our verse, right, that Jesus went through the cities and the villages. Think about this. In that one small area, he was serving 3 million people, healing their sickness, teaching, and preaching. Sometimes we're... Oh, I've had a long day. I don't know if I can show up to church to teach tonight. Or I don't know if I can follow through with this study I've got going on. And Jesus just went from place to place teaching and preaching about God, about God's marvelous grace. And I want you to think about three million people just in that one small area. <coughs> The Bible says he went through their preaching and teaching and healing. You want a threefold ministry of Jesus right here? It is. And again, all of that was a confirmation of his deity. Now, think about it. When we accept Jesus as Lord, we understand he's a servant. What do we need to be? We're disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ. We must be servants too. Do you realize that you, come in, you came in here this morning to worship? But when we leave, we leave to work. 
because the fields are ripe for harvest. So how did Jesus, uh, what, was the, what was his compassion like? Well, his compassion moved him to serve people. But, but what else do we see? We also see how Jesus saw people. I, I'll tell you how we see people today. I talked about people watching. We see color. We see gender. Right? We see social status. Economic wealth. That's the way we see people, right? We see people as maybe less deserving. We, we don't appreciate every individual in life. If you don't believe me, turn on the news. Click on your social media quickly and you'll see that we don't really appreciate people. Appreciate their uniqueness. Appreciate their difference. That's the way God's kingdom ought to look, amen? Jesus talked about bringing in uh, a net with a bunch of fish. You know, you know, how many of you are fishermen in here? Some of you are fishermen? You, you know, when I, when I go fishing, generally I'm fishing for a couple of different things that I can eat. There's some fish that, that we don't like, we throw them back, we call them junk fish, right? Jesus, when he pulled out in that big net of fish, he said, listen, this is the way God's kingdom is, all different kinds. Don't start sorting them and throwing them back. Let God do that. See, he wants us to have a vision for people. How did Jesus see people? Notice that he saw them helpless and, hara and harassed. How do you see people when you people watch? Yeah, first of all, we're going to recognize they're lost and we need to do something about it. It's going to move us to do something about it. But we see them helpless and harassed. Have you thought about those two words? <clears throat> the word harassed literally means weary. Again, back to JB's uh, prayer a few moments ago. There are a lot of people weary right here in this church, but there are a lot of people weary right here in this county. And, and some, yes, because of their own doing. And some had no clue that that train wreck was going to happen. Lives are turned upside down. Jesus saw people as weary, troubled, battered, bruised, worn out, exhausted. You don't have to talk to people very long, right, before you start to realize there's a lot of difficulty going on in the lives of people around us. You don't have to talk to people in here very long before we recognize that. But he also saw them helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. You realize that sheep uh, need a shepherd? Right, if they fall over, they can't right themselves. If they, can't, if they get lost, they can't find their way back. They need a shepherd. They need someone to help them and to guide them. And that's the way Jesus described himself as well. He is the good shepherd, right? He's the one that allows us to, to go in and out and to find green pasture and to drink fresh water. It's Jesus, the shepherd, who blesses us. But these people were helpless and hopeless. What was the reason that Jesus was moved to see these people that way and to serve them? Well, again, it was his compassion. Someone said that they believed that compassion is the missing jewel in the crown of the church today. Well, I hope that's not true of this church. It may be true of some churches, but I hope that we are a people that are filled with compassion. Whether we're the lower church or the upper church, I hope combined, right? We're a people who have compassion for others. You've heard that statement, they will never know, or never care how much you know until they know how much you care. I want to tell you, that, that, that's just true. Uh, it might be cliche, but it's, it's simply true. If we have compassion for others, they will know it. They will recognize it. If we help them and love them and serve them and see them the way that God sees them, they will, they will eventually come to know what we believe and why we do what we do. This is a true story. You, you, you're not going to think this is, this is a true story. I say that like some preacher's stories aren't true. That's, you know, this is, a, this is a true one right here, okay? Literally, it happened. September the 11th, 1992. Two years out of, out of high school for me in 1992. An unusual parking ticket was handed out on Peru Street in Los Angeles. True story. At 9.45 a.m., an officer woke up. Uh, wrote up a ticket 
for a Cadillac that was illegally parked. Now, there was no question that the car was in violation. The driver who was in the car gave no indication that he objected to the ticket. In fact, the driver didn't even say a word. The reason he didn't say a word, he was sitting behind the wheel of that car, dead. The officer had taken the time to observe the parking violation, write up a ticket, stick his hand through the window past that dead body and put the ticket on the dashboard of the car. Never realizing that the man was dead, the police officer placed a $30 citation on the dashboard but never knew that the guy was dead. I think about how, how does something like that really happen? But from a spiritual flip side point, we do the same thing every day. People are passing by us who are dead in their sin, and we walk by as if we do not notice. And Jesus would say to us, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields. They are ripe and ready for harvest. We need to be willing to go, right? We need to be a going church for a coming Lord. Jesus is coming back. Right? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. He's coming back a second time. We need to be a going church for a coming Lord. I love the story of the little boy who was talking to his dad. His dad was going to give him an English lesson. This little boy uh, was guilty of, of uh, talking about how uh, he used the word ain't. How many of us use the word ain't? Right? We're guilty. We're just as guilty as this little boy. This little boy used the word ain't, and his dad was going to give him a lesson on this day wanted his boy to speak properly. So as the, boy, uh, the dad told the little boy, he said, he said son, you, you shouldn't say I ain't going. That's not proper English, right? Now in the South it is. But he said, that's not proper English. And so dads, like most dads, decided he was going to give a quick lesson, right? We do that, don't we? My kids love those lessons, by the way. And... Uh, Here's what he said. He said, son, I want you to listen carefully. He said, first person singular, I am not going. Second person singular, we are not going. I mean, uh, uh, he is not going. First person plural, we are not going. You notice I'm having to read this, right? <laughs> Second person, uh, first person plural, we are not going. Second person plural, you are not going. Third person plural, they are not going. Right? He said, son, do you understand? The little boy said, yeah, dad, I think I get it. It sounds to me like ain't nobody going. <laughs> well, well, there's some truth to that. And again, I hope, I hope in the church that, that God's not trying to give us this lesson to say, I want you to go. And we're sitting back saying, well, ain't nobody going. No, at Washington Street, we want to be going. Amen? You know, I, I, think, about, I think about the invitation. The invitation is often... Uh, given every Sunday. It's often given to people and we're wanting them to respond to Jesus. Well, well how about the church just say today, you know, I, I might be right with Jesus, but I want to respond to be on his team and to be willing to go. What about if we said, you know, you know if, you're, if you're a sinner, you just sit down today. You let us know before you leave and we'll, we'll talk to you personally. But if you're not a sinner, we need you to go and we need you, if you want to go, to come forward. How many people would respond to the invitation? Are we like that little boy? Sounds to me like ain't nobody going. I think about Proverbs 24. I don't know if you've thought about this. Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24 is one of those interesting verses. Again, you remember Jeremiah 8, 20. It's one of those verses that kind of wake us up. Proverbs 24 is that. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart Perceive it? Can't say you don't know anything about it. God knows our hearts. 
Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? You know, most of the time when we think about being judged for our deeds, what we've done, isn't it that a lot of time we're considering, uh, for example, bad things that we've done? Well, again, let's make no mistake about it. We've all done something that we shouldn't have done. We've said things that we shouldn't have said. We're all guilty. No one's exempt from that. But what about failing to do the good that we know we should do? What does James say? To him who knows to do good, help me out, and does not do it, to him it is. Let's think about our responsibility to serve Jesus. To see people the way Jesus sees people. But how did he seek ministry? How did, he, how did he look for ministers to serve and to go out and gather the harvest? Well, did, did you catch what he said? Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. Here's what's interesting about all of this. What's interesting about all of this is that Jesus doesn't tell us to pray for the harvest. You remember Jesus had this um, discussion and it was really about Judas and money and and uh, Jesus talked about, they were concerned with, with the money and what certain things could be sold for and what that money could be used for if, it, if, those, if that perfume was sold. And you remember Jesus makes this just random statement, not that it's random, but just out of context. He said, the poor you have with you always. That's a true statement. You're never going to be lacking in your opportunity to serve and do good to help those who are poor. The same is true about the harvest. The harvest is always ready. The fields are always right. And Jesus needs you and me to go out into the harvest fields. And again, he's not telling us to pray for the harvest. He's saying, I need you to pray for the people in my kingdom to go out and bring the harvest in. Because it goes back to that one statement when I, that I, I mentioned to you earlier. If you want to underline one statement... The laborers are few. Let that sink in. Before we pray that prayer, though, for God to send out, and before you start praying that prayer, need to, you need to understand that you, me, we might be the very answer to that prayer. You start praying that prayer and God's going to start moving in you to go out and to be a worker into his fields. You pray for God to send out laborers to his harvest field. And he's asking for you to be an answer to that prayer. He, he wants every member to be turned into a minister. And he wants every saint to be turned into a servant. That's what Jesus desires from you and me. Now, when we came in here this morning, we came to recognize our Lord, to worship Him. But as we leave this morning, let's understand our responsibility. Let's be moved with compassion to serve and to see and to be an answer to the prayer for laborers to go out into His harvest field. It is true that we are going to offer an invitation. Mark's going to lead us in a song. I know that song has been selected. It's been prayed over. I know the words have been thought about. It's not just uh, haphazard or, or just spur of the moment or off the cuff. I get those songs at the beginning of the week from Mark. He wants to know what I'm preaching, which means I have to do a little work in advance. But he prepares these songs. And this song has been selected as a motivation for us to understand our responsibility this morning. If you are here and in need of the grace of our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, you can believe in Him, turn your life over to Him, and give your allegiance to Jesus, repent of your sins, confess His matchless name that He is the one true and living God, and then you can be immersed in the waters of baptism to have your sins washed away. That's, that's what God wants us to do. That's what we're pleading for you to do. If you are a member of this church, 
and you just want to come forward this morning and say, you know what? I have not been doing it, but I want to get on board with doing it. I want to be willing to, I want to be a going person for a coming Lord, and you want to help us to be a going church for a coming Lord, then you come forward too this morning. As together we stand. And as we sing. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't get home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. In heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Just one prayer request we have on our list today. Daryl Mills, uh, I know he's in on your minds and hearts and you're praying for him. His uh, bi brain biopsy went smoothly and he's ex they're expecting to receive results in a few days, right? That's, that's the latest I have. Um, so, so Jesus promised that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be with you also. So we know Jesus. Every time we come together, Jesus is among us. His spirit is with us. Um, what you might not have realized today is Isaiah was also with us today. And uh, Isaiah Owens, if you, if you don't mind, come on up and join me. Isaiah's going to lead us in our closing prayer today. Um, Isaiah served this congregation. Come on up. You don't be shy now. You, this is home for you. Isaiah was one of our youth interns in 2012. Is that right? Oh, oh even further back than that. Okay. Um, in any event. Uh, well, step on a little closer. I haven't even shaken your hand today. Welcome. It's so good to have you back with us. Um, so, so uh, no longer a young, young, young man in college. You're married. Tell, tell us, give us 30 seconds about where, you, where you've come, because a lot of these folks remember you when you were working with the youth. Yes. Um, I'm in Jacksonville, North Carolina. I serve the local Grove Church of Christ. That's the preacher minister there. Um, I have less hair, more braids. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have four children, a beautiful uh, I don't know. I know Sonia came when I was interning here. She That's came, right. I don't remember if she came to Sunday morning, but she was here. We did get up and married and have four beautiful children. 
Um, life is going well. God is good, and I'm just happy to be here. It's good to be. This is the first place they gave me ministry opportunity, so I was in Nashville for. Uh, I'm doing my MBA in that Clipsville now, and uh, I had to come home. <laughs> Amen. 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 Yeah, it's good. Lake is buried now. It's crazy, right? <laughs> little, little bro is buried. Both of them are buried now. Paul is buried. It's good to be here with that. And uh, I'm just grateful to be here. Amen. Or lead us in closing prayer, brother. Thank you for coming and being with us this time. Lord, we thank you for this day. We give you all the glory and honor for who you are and who we are. We thank you for being our God. It's so privileged, Lord, to be called the people. We thank you, Lord, for this challenging word that was sent out for us today, Lord, to be workers in your kingdom. If anyone's going to go, Lord, we pray, Lord, that we will pray the prayer that you can send us uh, to preach the gospel to the lost and be saved souls. Now, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to bless us, Lord, as we take that challenge, Lord, that you will bless us with every tool that we need, Lord, to fulfill that mission so that the world will be blessed by the life and ministry of Christ. Continue, Lord, to bless this church. Continue, Lord, to guide them and protect them in all their ministry endeavors. Now, Lord, we actually want to ask you about to leave this place, Lord, but we'll never leave your presence.